Take a look. <laughs> he asked me if, he, if I would uh, cooperate in a, in a portrait, and I said I'd be glad to. And then he explained that he was going to do a series of these portraits uh, in preparation for a show uh, uh, exhibiting uh, faces of the North Fork. Uh, in the process of, of talking with him, it came out that he was looking interested in suggestions of other people that would have an interesting face and also an interesting story. Pearl Harbor. Our west coast became a potential combat zone, but no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them citizens and aliens alike would have to move. I finished art school about a year and a half. I was there about a year and a half, for almost two years. And we were confined. You know, we were confined. There were more Japanese in Los Angeles than in any other area. In nearby San Pedro, houses and hotels, occupied almost exclusively by Japanese, were within a stone throw of a naval air base. Shipyards oil wells. Japanese fishermen had every opportunity to watch the movement of our ships. Japanese farmers were living close to vital aircraft plants. So as a first step, all Japanese were required to move from critical areas such as these. But of course this limited evacuation was a solution to only part of the problem. The larger problem, the uncertainty of what would happen among these people in case of a Japanese invasion, still remained. That is why the commanding general of the Western Defense Command determined that all Japanese within the coastal area should move inland. Immediately the army began mapping evacuation areas and for a time encouraged the Japanese to leave voluntarily. The trouble for the voluntary evacuees soon threatened in their new locations. So the program was quickly put on a planned and protected basis. Thereafter the American citizen Japanese and Japanese aliens made their plans in accordance with army orders. Notices were posted. All persons of Japanese descent were required to register. Executive Order 9066 was signed in February of 1942 by Franklin Roosevelt and it followed um, six to eight weeks worth of um, maneuvering within the federal government between the Justice Department on the one hand and the military on the other hand. There's been a fair amount of research that's done on exactly what was behind 9066, and the consensus of historians is that um, it emerged from several different factors. Uh, obviously, the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor was the main precipitating factor. Without the attack on Pearl Harbor, there would never have been a relocation of Japanese Americans. But beyond, the, beyond the, that sneak attack, there was a long history of anti-Japanese and anti-Asian racism particularly along the West Coast, that had been in place uh, ever since the Japanese and Chinese had begun to come to the United States and um, had mounted as Japanese farmers became extremely successful on the West Coast uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So I moved out of <clears throat> that home and I went into a hotel near the uh, Woodward, Woodbury College to a hotel and it was run by a very interesting man. His name was McIntyre, his wife Peggy. So you had racism, you had, um, uh, you had um, a kind of xenophobia. Um, there were um, organizations like the Native Sons of the Golden West along the West Coast that very much believed that the West Coast and the United States as a whole should be a white person's or a white man's terrain, uh, and that people who were foreign and seen as not being capable of assimilation, like Asians, for example, should be removed from the
country. So you had that xenophobic instinct. He was the manager of the hotel. Okay. Where you stay. And his wife was with him and she used to make corned beef sandwiches, corned beef out of the can. But it was so wonderful with her hot coffee when I came back from my work. But it was a sleazy place. I learned later that my neighbor was a prostitute and her red light that came out of her window reflected against another window across the street and then reflected into mine so I had this red glow through my room from this lady next door. You also had a strong economic motivation because um, the Japanese, as I mentioned a moment ago, were very, very successful farmers uh, and they had um, managed to accomplish um, successes in farming that uh, the white farmers had not been able to attain. So there were great, there were great economic resentments against Japanese farmers uh, all along the West Coast. But McIntyre was a real, real friend. He carried a gun to protect me. Did you need protection? At oh, God. Japanese Americans, or anyone Japanese in LA, when the war began, I, ha I had a job at the fruit stand still, because <clears throat> I held a job. Well, I went to school and I went to the job in a, after school and closed it at midnight and coming back on a bus, it was treacherous. So Mac just said, don't worry, Neil. He pulled his gun out. He says, as long as you're here, I'll protect you. So when the Pearl Harbor attack happened, you had this sort of perfect storm of factors. You had a military threat to the West Coast that got extremely exaggerated through fear and paranoia, um, hysteria. You had a long-seated racism along the West Coast that saw the Japanese and their children as um, a different breed of human, somebody that was not capable of assimilation into American society. And then one night I came back from work. Well, the atmosphere was hostile. Remember now, this is everyone who looks at a Japanese in L.A. Any Japanese is an enemy. And yes, there certainly were incidents um, uh, of um, threats, verbal threats, uh, people getting beat up, um, uh, um, various kinds of, um, you know, sort of mild to moderate violence being deployed against, uh, against Japanese immigrants and against their children. Um, uh, it was not um, to the level of, you know, sort of being the kind of crisis that would have required um, calling out the National Guard or something. Um, it was not like, you know, riots. Uh, but um, there were uh, many reported instances of threats, uh, of, um, uh, you know, being roughed up, um, being shouted at, hooted at from cars passing by, um, being the um, recipient of various kinds of verbal slurs, called Japs and other things. And, and even in school, I had to be very, it's, it was very awesome. It's um, your friends, you know, your friends, who were your friends in school? You didn't know what they were thinking, what, what they were. So it was a, it was a tense, very tense, um, fearful time for Japanese aliens and for American citizens of Japanese ancestry after Pearl Harbor. But one night I came back from, uh, from work and uh, McIntyre, <laughs> he, was, he was a religious man, I guess. He introduced me to religion. <laughs> he said, come here, Neil, stand in front of this mirror. So I stood in front of the mirror, and he said, you see that reflection of you in that mirror? Now let's assume that you're God standing in front of the mirror. 
and that reflection is you personally. Originally, you're, you're God here. You're a reflection of God in that mirror. And he says, the goddamn trouble in this world is God is still standing there in front of the mirror and the reflections have moved out and living the life of their own. I says, boy, <laughs> what a way to introduce me to He was, a, he was a wonderful man. Certainly, um, in situations where people knew each other, if people were neighbors or co-workers, um, that tended to, um, uh, that tended to um, overcome those fears and suspicions. So there are lots and lots of stories of Japanese and Japanese Americans um, sustaining friendships with their white neighbors um, throughout this period. Um, so it's not as though every single person um, who was not Japanese American was desperately afraid of every person who was Japanese American. But as a whole, um, particularly those who had very little contact with Japanese and Japanese Americans, it would have been an attitude of suspicion uh, or resentment or fear. And then I left because my neighbor was just too busy with her occupation. And I told McIntyre, I said, I just have to go. I've got to, got to do my work. I mean, it's, you know, my schoolwork. Can you imagine thinking of your schoolwork at a time like that? The war was on. God knows what our fate was going to be. I didn't know what was going to happen. FDR signed 9066 in mid-February, and a few days later, Congress passed a law, passed a criminal statute that made it a federal misdemeanor to defy the orders of a military commander that were entered pursuant to 9066. Once the military commander on the West Coast issued those orders forcing people to report for removal, um, any person risked uh, prosecution in federal court uh, and the punishment would have been up to a year in prison or up to five and up to a five thousand dollar fine um, so that's what he would have risked if he had um, continued to defy um, the orders to report for for internment so i moved into another hotel this is all in the space of a few months my parents didn't know where i was what i was doing what was uh, happening to all of us so I went into another hotel. Well, this one was really seedy. It was run by a Japanese woman, beautiful woman. But the hotel was, well, the beds had bed bugs. And I, look up, I opened the window of my room and looked down and I said, my God, what am I doing here? after all of these months. All through the period, at the rooming house on Arapaho, near Arapaho, the lady who kicked me out, Woodbury College Hotel, all through this month, three, four, five months maybe, I saw a blue Buick parked outside of the first house I lived in. But I didn't know what, you know, who he was. The street I was lived on was very nice. And I saw lovers on the street, you know, making love in the car. And I saw this blue, blue Buick. Neil eventually clarified his initial residence when he relocated from Hawaii to Los Angeles in 1939. Uh, his first stay was at a home of a doctor of some sort. He never disclosed his name. He eventually moved into a house closer to school and work in LA and until he was kicked out by that lady after the Pearl Harbor attack. I was sitting there. Oh, I didn't think too much about it. <clears throat> then I saw the same Buick at the Woodbury Hotel. Outside, there was a bar at the corner of the street. 
I saw the same Buick, I saw the same car. I said, what could it be? Was there any link to this? No. I, I ignored it. And then now in this Japanese woman's hotel on Temple and Hill Street. I opened the shade to the window because I had my door locked in this. <clears throat> A note was brought up from this lady, landlady, and slipped under my door. And a note said, are you ready to come home now? <laughs> the doctor, whom I left, he had hired a private detective to keep his eye on me since I left him. From three moves that I made, and I came to this one, I opened the shade and looked out, and there was the same blue Buick and a driver waiting for me. See, because the note said, are you ready to come home now? Hmm. So I backed up and went with him back to Run the Vista Drive. <laughs> and I was there with him, with a doctor. <clears throat> the wall was on. Newspapers were saying there'd be relocation. And I was the only Japanese descent up on the hill on Ronda Vista Drive. You had uh, then also strong economic interests that had been lobbying to try to get Japanese and Japanese Americans out of the United States for decades. And that all kind of coalesced together uh, and led to extremely strong political support coming from the congressional delegations along the West Coast in December and especially January of 1942, putting pressure and pressure and pressure on the military to forcibly remove everybody of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. And ultimately the military prevailed over the protests of the lawyers of the Justice Department who thought this was unnecessary and illegal, uh, but the military prevailed and got Roosevelt to sign 9066 on February 19th of 1942. He said, Neil, why don't you leave right now and go to White House, Ohio. White House is a province of Ohio, near Ohio University. He said, you can continue with your school, with your studies. Stay with my parents. It was very thoughtful of him. I said, you know, doctor, I wish I could, but I've got to stay with this. If the Japanese are going to be evacuated, I must go with them. I've got to be, you know, I've got to be part of this. I can't just scoot and go. There's something I, I have to learn, maybe. I evacuated. We were given notices, you know, where to meet, where to catch the bus, what to bring. So you followed, came forward to be evacuated? Yeah. <clears throat> I came forward because there was so much I didn't know and I, got, I had to learn and I had to be a part of. Is walking into something. I don't know what it was. And we caught our bus. I had two suitcases. What we can carry. I went into the assembly center in Pomona. And we were there for about five months. Five thousand people in this first camp. Barbed wire. Towers, searchlight, machine guns up in the tower. And we were trying to find a semblance of our life, you know, in this, in this camp. And then about five months later, 
we were given orders to move out. We took the train from Pomona all the way through Idaho to Wyoming, but we didn't know where we were going. Except we heard that it would be in somewhere in Wyoming. And if I recall American history, this is the prairie where the Shoshones live, the Crows, the Rappahoes. But out in that plain where tumbleweeds just rolled, they built a camp with barbed wire around it that held 10,000 people. It was a near a town near Cody, Wyoming, and a town near Powell, Wyoming. I remember those names because I returned to them recently. So I was there about a year and a half. 